of the interview the curate and the barber had with Don. Quixote about his malady. Side Hamid Benengeli, in the second part of this history, and third Sally of Don Quixote, says that the curate and the barber remained nearly a month without seeing him, lest they should recall or bring back to his recollection what had taken place. They did not, however, omit to visit his niece and housekeeper, and charge them to be careful to treat him with attention, and give him comforting things to eat, and such as were good for the heart and the brain, whence, it was plain to see, all his misfortune proceeded. The niece and housekeeper replied that they did so, and meant to do so with all possible care and assiduity, for they could perceive that their master was now, and then beginning to show signs of being in his right mind. This gave great satisfaction to the curate and the barber, for they concluded they had taken the right course in carrying him off enchanted on the ox minus cart as has been described in the first part of this great as well as accurate history in the last chapter thereof. So they resolved to pay him a visit and test the improvement in his condition, although they thought it almost impossible that there could be any, and they agreed not to touch upon any point connected with night minus errantry so as not to run the risk of reopening wounds which were still so tender. They came to see him consequently, and found him sitting up in bed in a green baize waistcoat and a red Toledo cap, and so withered and dried up that he looked as if he had been turned into a mummy. They were very cordially received by him, they asked him after his health, and he talked to them about himself very naturally and in very well minus chosen language. In the course of their conversation they fell to discussing what they call state minus craft and systems of government, correcting this abuse and condemning that, reforming one practice and abolishing another, each of the three setting up for a new legislator, a modern Lycurgus, or a brand minus new Solon, and so completely did they remodel the state, that they seemed to have thrust it into a furnace and taken out something quite different from what they had put in, and on all the subjects they dealt. With, Don Quixote spoke with such good sense that the pair of examiners were fully convinced that he was quite recovered and in his full senses. The niece and housekeeper were present at the conversation and could not find words enough to express their thanks to God at seeing their master so clear in his mind, the curate however, changing his original plan, which was to avoid touching upon matters of chivalry, resolved to test Don Quixote's recovery thoroughly and see whether it were genuine or not, and so, from one subject to another, he came at last to talk of the news that had come from the capital, and among other things, he said it was considered certain that the Turk was Don Quixote. Chapter 1404 Coming down with a powerful fleet, and that no one knew what his purpose was, or when the great storm would burst, and that all Christendom was in apprehension of this, which almost every year calls us to arms, and that His Majesty had made provision for the security of the coasts of Naples and Sicily, and the island of Malta. To this Don Quixote replied, His Majesty has acted like a prudent warrior in providing for the safety of his realms in time so that the enemy may not find him unprepared, but if my advice were taken I would recommend him to adopt a measure which at present, no doubt, his majesty is very far from thinking of. The moment the curate heard this he said to himself, God keep thee in his hand, poor Don Quixote, for it seems to me thou art precipitating thyself from the height of thy madness into the profound abyss of thy simplicity. But the barber, who had the same suspicion as the curate, asked Don Quixote what would be his advice as to the measures that he said ought to be adopted for perhaps it might prove to be one that would have to be added to the list of the many impertinent suggestions that people were in the habit of offering to princes. Mine, Master Shaver, said Don Quixote, will not be impertinent, but, on the contrary, pertinent. I don't mean that, said the barber, but that experience has shown that all or most of the expedients which are proposed to his majesty are either impossible, or absurd, or injurious to the king and to the kingdom. Mine, however, replied Don Quixote, is neither impossible nor absurd, but the easiest, the most reasonable, the readiest and most expeditious that could suggest itself to any projector's mind. You take a long time to tell it, Senor Don Quixote, said the curate. I don't choose to tell it here now, said Don Quixote, and have it reach the ears of the lords of the council to minus morrow morning, and some other carry off the thanks and rewards of my trouble. For my Part, said the barber, I give my word here and before God that I will not repeat what your worship says, to king, rook or earthly man minus an oath I learned from the ballad of the curate, who in the prelude, told the king of the thief who had robbed him of the hundred gold crowns in his pacing mule. I am not versed in stories, said Don Quixote, but I know the oath is a good one, because I know the barber to be an honest fellow. Don Quixote 
Chapter 1 405 Even if he were not, said the curate, I will go bail and answer for him that in this matter he will be as silent as a dummy, under pain of paying any penalty that may be pronounced. And who will be security for you, senor curate, said Don Quixote. My profession, replied the curate, which is to keep secrets. ODS body, said Don Quixote at this, what more has his majesty to do, but to command, by public proclamation, all the knights minus errant that are scattered over Spain to assemble on a fixed day in the capital, for even if no more than half a dozen come, there may be one among them who alone will suffice to destroy the entire might of the Turk. Give me your attention and follow me. Is it, pray, any new thing for a single knight minus errant to demolish an army of two hundred thousand men, as if they all had but one throat, or were made of sugar paste? Nay, tell me, how many histories are there filled with these marvels? If only, in an evil hour for me, I don't speak for anyone else, the famous Don Belianis were alive now, or any one of the innumerable progeny of Amatis of Gaul. If any of these were alive today, and were to come face to face with the Turk, by my faith, I would not give much for the Turk's chance. But God will have regard for his people, and will provide some. One who, if not so valiant as the knights minus errant of yore, at least will not be inferior to them. In spirit, but God knows what I mean, and I say no more. Alas, exclaimed the niece at this, may I die if my master does not want to turn knight minus errant again. To which Don Quixote replied, a knight minus errant I shall die, and let the Turk come down, or go up when he likes, and in as strong force as he can, once more I say, God knows what I mean. But here the barber said, I ask your worships to give me leave to tell a short story of something that happened in Seville, which comes so pat to the purpose just now that I should like greatly to tell it. Don Quixote gave him leave, and the rest prepared to listen, and he began thus. In the madhouse at Seville there was a man whom his relations had placed there as being out of his mind. He was a graduate of Osuna in canon law, but even if he had been of Salamanca, it was the opinion of most people that he would have been mad all the same. This graduate, after some years of confinement, took it into his head that he was sane, and in his full senses, and under this impression wrote to the archbishop, entreating him earnestly, and in very correct language, to have him released from the misery in which he was living, for by God's mercy he had now recovered his lost reason, though his relations, in order to enjoy his property, kept him there, and, in spite of the truth, would make him out to be mad until his dying day. The archbishop, moved by repeated sensible, well minus written letters, directed one of his chaplains to make inquiry of the madhouse as to the truth of the licentiate statements, and to have an interview with the madman himself, and, if it should, appear that he was in his senses, to take him out and restore him to liberty. The chaplain did. So, and the governor assured him that the man was still mad, and that though he often spoke. Don Quixote Chapter 1 406 Like a highly intelligent person, he would in the end break out into nonsense that in quantity and quality counterbalanced all the sensible things he had said before, as might be easily tested by talking to him. The chaplain resolved to try the experiment, and obtaining access to the madman conversed with him for an hour or more, during the whole of which time he never uttered a word that was incoherent or absurd, but on the contrary, spoke so rationally that the chaplain was compelled to believe him to be sane. Among other things, he said the governor was against him, not to lose the presence his relations made him for reporting him still mad, but with lucid intervals, and that the worst foe he had in his misfortune was his large property for in order to enjoy it his enemies disparaged and threw doubts upon the mercy our Lord had shown him in turning him from a brute beast into a man. In short, he spoke in such a way that he cast suspicion on the governor, and made his relations appear covetous and heartless, and himself so rational that the chaplain determined to take him away with him that the archbishop might see him, and ascertain for himself the truth of the matter. Yielding to this conviction, the worthy chaplain begged the governor to have the clothes in which the licentiate had entered the house given to him. The governor again bade him beware of what he was doing, as the licentiate was beyond a doubt still mad, but all his cautions and warnings were unavailing to dissuade the chaplain from taking him away. The governor, seeing that it was the order of the archbishop, obeyed, and they dressed the licentiate in his own clothes, which were new and decent. He, as soon as he saw himself clothed like one in his senses, and divested of the appearance of a madman, entreated the chaplain to permit him in charity to go and take leave of his comrades the madman. The chaplain said he would go with him to see what madmen there were in the house, so they went upstairs and with them some of those who were present. Approaching a cage in which 
There was a furious madman, though just at that moment calm and quiet, the licentiate said to him, Brother, think if you have any commands for me, for I am going home, as God has been pleased in his infinite goodness and mercy, without any merit of mine, to restore me my reason. I am now cured and in my senses, for with God's power nothing is impossible. Have strong hope and trust in him, for as he has restored me to my original condition, so likewise he will restore you if you trust in him. I will take care to send you some good things to eat, and be sure you eat them, for I would have you know I am convinced, as one who has gone through it, that all this madness of ours comes of having the stomach empty and the brains full of wind. Take courage. Take courage. For despondency and misfortune breaks down health and brings on death. To all these words of the licentiate another madman in a cage opposite that of the furious one was listening, and raising himself up from an old mat on which he lay stark naked, he asked in a loud voice who it was that was going away cured and in his senses. The licentiate answered, It is I, brother, who am going, I have now no need to remain here any longer, for which I return infinite thanks to heaven that has had so great mercy upon me. Mind what you are saying, licentiate, don't let the devil deceive you, replied the madman. Keep quiet, stay where you are, and you will save yourself the trouble of coming back. Don Quixote Chapter 1 407 I know I am cured, returned the licentiate, and that I shall not have to go stations again. You cured, said the madman. Well, we shall see, God be with you, but I swear to you by Jupiter, whose majesty I represent on earth, that for this crime alone, which Seville is committing to minus day and releasing you from this house, and treating you as if you were in your senses, I shall have to inflict such a punishment on it as will be remembered for ages and ages, amen. Dost thou not know, thou miserable little licentiate, that I can do it, being, as I say, Jupiter the Thunderer, who hold in my hands the fiery bolts with which I am able and am wont to threaten and lay waste the world? But in one way only will I punish this ignorant town, and that is by not raining upon it, nor on any part of its district or territory, for three whole years, to be reckoned from the day and moment when this threat is pronounced. Thou free, thou cured, thou in thy senses. And I mad, I disordered, I bound. I will as soon think of sending rain as of hanging myself. Those present stood listening to the words and exclamations of the madman, but our licentiate, turning to the chaplain and seizing him by the hands, said to him, Be not uneasy, senor, attach no importance to what this madman has said, for if he is Jupiter and will not send rain, I who am Neptune, the father and god of the waters, will rain as often as it pleases me and may be needful. The governor and the bystanders laughed, and at their laughter the chaplain was half ashamed, and he replied, For all that, Senor Neptune, it will not do to vex Senor Jupiter, remain where you are, and some other day, when there is a better opportunity and more time, we will come back for you. So they stripped the licentiate, and he was left where he was, and that's the end of the story. So that's the story, Master Barber, said Don Quixote, which came in so pat to the purpose that you could not help telling it. Master Shaver, Master Shaver. How blind is he who cannot see through a sieve? Is it possible that you do not know that comparisons of wit with wit, valor with valor, beauty with beauty, birth with birth, are always odious and unwelcome? I, Master Barber, am not Neptune, the god of the waters, nor do I try to make anyone take me for an astute man, for I am not one. My only endeavor is to convince the world of the mistake it makes in not reviving in itself the happy time when the order of night minus errantry was in the field. But our depraved age does not deserve to enjoy such a blessing as those ages enjoyed when knights minus errant took upon their shoulders the defense of kingdoms, the protection of damsels, the succor of orphans and minors, the chastisement of the proud, and the recompense of the humble. With the knights of these days, for the most part, it is the damask, brocade, and rich stuffs they wear that rustle as they go, not the chain. Mail of their armor. No night now minus a minus days sleeps in the open field exposed to the inclemency of heaven, and in full panoply from head to foot, no one now takes a nap, as they call it, without drawing his feet out of the stirrups, and leaning upon his lance, as the knights minus errant used to do, no one now, issuing from the wood, penetrates yonder mountains. Don Quixote Chapter 1 408 And then treads the baron, Lonely shore of the sea minus mostly a tempestuous and stormy one minus and finding on the beach a little bark without oars, sail, mast, or tackling of any kind, in the intrepidity of his heart flings himself into it and commits himself to the wrathful billows of the deep sea, that one moment lift him up to heaven and the next plunge him into the depths, and opposing his breast to the irresistible gale, finds himself, when he least expects it, three thousand leagues and more away from the place where he embarked, 
and leaping ashore in a remote and unknown land has adventures that deserve to be written, not on parchment, but on brass. But now sloth triumphs over energy, indolence over exertion, vice over virtue, arrogance over courage, and theory over practice in arms, which flourished and shone only in the golden ages and in knights minus errant. For tell me, who was more virtuous and more valiant than the famous Amatus of Gaul? Who more discreet than Pomeran of England? Who more gracious and easy than Tirante el Blanco? Who more courtly than Lisuard of Greece? Who more slashed or slashing than Don Belianis? Who more intrepid than Pyrian of Gaul? Who more ready to face danger than Felix Mart of Hyrcania? Who more sincere than Esplandian? Who more impetuous than Don Serangilio of Thrace? Who more bold than Rodamont? Who more prudent than King Sabrino? Who more daring than Reynaldos? Who more invincible than Roland? And who more gallant and courteous than Ruggiero, from whom the Dukes of Ferrara of the present day are descended, according to Turpin in his cosmography? All these knights, and many more that I could name, Senor Curate, were knights minus errant, the light and glory of chivalry. These, or such as these, I would have to carry out my plan, and in that case his majesty would find himself well served and would save great expense, and the Turk would be left tearing his beard. And so I will stay where I am. As the chaplain does not take me away, and if Jupiter, as the barber has told us, will not send. Reign, here am I, and I will reign when I please. I say this that Master Basin may know that I understand him. Indeed, Senor Don Quixote, said the barber, I did not mean it in that way, and, so help me God, my intention was good, and your worship ought not to be vexed. As to whether I ought to be vexed or not, returned Don Quixote, I myself am the best judge. Hereupon the curate observed, I have hardly said a word as yet, and I would gladly be relieved of a doubt, arising from what Don Quixote has said, that worries and works my conscience. The senior curate has leave for more than that, returned Don Quixote, so he may declare his doubt, for it is not pleasant to have a doubt on one's conscience. Well then, with that permission, said the curate, I say my doubt is that, all I can do, I cannot persuade myself that the whole pack of knights minus errant you, Senor Don Quixote, have mentioned, were really and truly persons of flesh and blood, that ever lived in the world, on the contrary, I suspect it to be all fiction, fable, and falsehood, and dreams told by men. Don Quixote Chapter 1409 Awaken from sleep, or rather still half asleep. That is another mistake, replied Don Quixote, into which many have fallen who do not believe that there ever were such knights in the world, and I have often, with diverse people and on divers occasions, tried to expose this almost universal error to the light of truth. Sometimes I have not been successful in my purpose, sometimes I have, supporting it upon the shoulders of the truth, which truth is so clear that I can almost say I have with my own eyes seen Amatus of Gaul, who was a man of lofty stature, fair complexion, with a handsome though black beard, of a countenance between gentle and stern in expression, sparing of words, slow to anger, and quick to put it away from him, and as I have depicted Amatus, so I could, I think, portray and describe all. The knights minus errant that are in all the histories in the world, for by the perception I have that they were what their histories. Describe, and by the deeds they did and the dispositions they displayed, it is possible, with the aid of sound philosophy, to deduce their features, complexion, and stature. How big, in your worship's opinion, may the giant Morganta have been, Senor Don Quixote, asked the barber. With regard to giants, replied Don Quixote, opinions differ as to whether there ever were any or not in the world, but the holy scripture, which cannot err by a jot from the truth, shows us that there were, when it gives us the history of that big Philistine, Goliath, who was seven cubits and a half in height, which is a huge size. Likewise, in the island of Sicily, there have been found leg minus bones and arm minus bones so large that their size makes it plain that their owners were giants, and as tall as great towers, geometry puts this fact beyond a doubt. But for all that, I cannot speak with certainty as to the size of Morganta, though I suspect he cannot have been very tall, and I am inclined to be of this opinion because I find in the history in which his deeds are particularly mentioned, that he frequently slept under a roof and as he found houses to contain him, it is clear that his bulk could not have been anything excessive. That is true, said the curate, and yielding to the enjoyment of hearing such nonsense, 
he asked him what was his notion of the features of Reynaldos of Montalban, and Don Roland, and the rest of the twelve peers of France, for they were all knights minus errant. As for Reynaldos, replied Don Quixote, I venture to say that he was broad minus faced, of ruddy complexion, with roguish and somewhat prominent eyes, excessively punctilious and touchy, and given to the society of thieves and scapegraces. With regard to Roland, or Rotolando, or Orlando, for the histories call him by all these names, I am of opinion, and hold, that he was of middle height, broad minus shouldered, rather bow minus legged, swarthy minus complexioned, red minus bearded, with a hairy body, and a severe expression of countenance, a man of few words, but very polite and well minus bred. Don Quixote Chapter 1 410 If Roland was not a more graceful person than your worship has described, said the curate, it is no wonder that the fair lady Angelica rejected him and left him for the gaiety, liveliness, and grace of that budding minus bearded little more to whom she surrendered herself, and she showed her sense in falling in love with the gentle softness of Medaro rather than the roughness of Roland. That Angelica, senor curate, returned Don Quixote, was a giddy damsel, flighty and somewhat wanton, and she left the world as full of her vagaries as of the fame of her beauty. She treated with scorn a thousand gentlemen, men of valor and wisdom, and took up with a smooth minus faced sprig of a page, without fortune or fame, except such reputation for gratitude as the affection he bore his friend got for him. The great poet who sang her beauty, the famous Ariosto, not caring to sing her adventures after her contemptible surrender, which probably were not over, and above creditable, dropped her where he says. How she received the scepter of Cathay, some bard of defter quill may sing some day. And this was no doubt a kind of prophecy, for poets are also called vates, that is to say diviners, and its truth was made plain, for since then a famous Andalusian poet has lamented and sung her tears, and another famous and rare poet, a Castilian, has sung her beauty. Tell me, Senor Don Quixote, said the barber here, among all those who praised her, has there been no poet to write a satire on this lady Angelica? I can well believe, replied Don Quixote, that if Sacrapant or Roland had been poets they would have given the damsel a trimming, for it is naturally the way with poets who have been scorned and rejected by their ladies, whether fictitious or not, in short by those whom they select as the ladies of their thoughts, to avenge themselves in satires and libels minus a vengeance, to be sure, unworthy of generous hearts. But up to the present I have not heard of any defamatory verse against the Lady Angelica, who turned the world upside down. Strange, said the curate, but at this moment they heard the housekeeper and the niece, who had previously withdrawn from the conversation, exclaiming aloud in the courtyard, and at the noise they all ran out. Don Quixote Chapter 1 411 Chapter 2 Which treats of the notable altercation which Sancho Panza had with Don Quixote's niece and housekeeper, together with other droll matters. The history relates that the outcry Don Quixote the curate, and the barber heard came from the niece and the housekeeper exclaiming to Sancho, who was striving to force his way in to see Don Quixote, while they held the door against him, what does the vagabond want in this house? Be off to your own, brother, for it is you, and no one else, that delude my master, and lead him astray, and take him tramping about the country. To which Sancho replied, Devil's own housekeeper. It is I who am deluded, and led astray, and taken tramping about the country, and not thy master. He has carried me all over the world, and you are mightily mistaken. He enticed me away from home by a trick, promising me an island, which I am still waiting for. May evil islands choke thee, thou detestable Sancho, said the niece, what are islands? Is it something to eat, glutton and gormandizer that thou art? It is not something to eat, replied Sancho, but something to govern and rule, and better than four cities or four judgeships at court. For all that, said the housekeeper, you don't enter here, you bag of mischief and sack of knavery, go govern your house and dig your seed minus patch, and give over looking for islands or shylands. The curate and the barber listened with great amusement to the words of the three, but Don Quixote, uneasy lest Sancho should blab and blurt out a whole heap of mischievous stupidities and touch upon points that might not be altogether to his credit, called to him, and made the other two hold their tongues and let him come in. Sancho entered, and the curate and the barber took their leave of Don Quixote, of whose recovery they despaired when they saw how wedded he was to his crazy ideas, and how saturated with the nonsense of his unlucky chivalry, and said the curate to the barber, you will see, gossip, that when we are least thinking of it, our gentleman will be off once more for another flight. I have no doubt of it, returned the barber, 
but I do not wonder so much at the madness of the knight as at the simplicity of the squire, who has such a firm belief in all that about the island, that I suppose all the exposures that could be imagined would not get it out of his head. Don Quixote Chapter 2 412 God help them, said the curate, and let us be on the look minus out to see what comes of all these absurdities of the knight and squire, for it seems as if they had both been cast in the same mold, and the madness of the master without the simplicity of the man would not be worth a farthing. That is true, said the barber, and I should like very much to know what the pair are talking about at this moment. I promise you, said the curate, the niece or the housekeeper will tell us by minus and minus by, for they are not the ones to forget to listen. Meanwhile Don Quixote shut himself up in his room with Sancho, and when they were alone he said to him, It grieves me greatly, Sancho, that thou shouldst have said, and sayest, that I took thee out of thy cottage, when thou knowest I did not remain in my house. We sallied forth together, we took the road together, we wandered abroad together, we have had the same fortune and the same luck, if they blanketed thee once, they belabored me a hundred times, and that is the only advantage I have of thee. That was only reasonable, replied Sancho, for, by what your worship says, misfortunes belong more properly to knights minus errant than to their squires. Thou art mistaken, Sancho, said Don Quixote, according to the maxim quando capitalit. I don't understand any language but my own, said Sancho. I mean to say, said Don Quixote, that when the head suffers all the members suffer, and so, being thy lord and master, I am thy head, and thou a part of me as thou art my servant, and therefore any evil that affects or shall affect me should give thee pain, and what affects thee give pain to me. It should be so, said Sancho, but when I was blanketed as a member, my head was on the other side of the wall, looking on while I was flying through the air, and did not feel any pain whatever, and if the members are obliged to feel the suffering of the head, it should be obliged to feel their sufferings. Dost thou mean to say now, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that I did not feel when they were blanketing thee? If thou dost, thou must not say so or think so, for I felt more pain than in spirit than thou didst in body. But let us put that aside for the present, for we shall have opportunities enough for considering and settling the point. Tell me, Sancho, my friend, what do they say about me in the village here? What do the common people think of me? What do the Hidalgos? What do the Caballeros? What do they say of my valor, of my achievements, of my courtesy? How do they treat the task I have undertaken in reviving and restoring to? Don Quixote Chapter 2 413 The world the now forgotten order of chivalry? In short, Sancho, I would have thee tell me all that has come to thine ears on this subject, and thou art to tell me, without adding anything to the good or taking away anything from the bad, for it is the duty of loyal vassals to tell the truth to their lords just as it is and in its proper shape, not allowing flattery to add to it or any idle deference to lessen it. And I would have thee know, Sancho, that if the naked truth, undisguised by flattery, came to the ears of princes, times would be different, and other ages would be reckon iron ages more than ours, which I hold to be the golden of these latter days. Profit by this advice, Sancho, and report to me clearly and faithfully the truth of what thou knowest touching what I have demanded of thee. That I will do with all my heart, master, replied Sancho, provided your worship will not be vexed at what I say, as you wish me to say it out in all its nakedness, without putting any more clothes on it than it came to my knowledge in. I will not be vexed at all, returned Don Quixote, thou mayest speak freely, Sancho, and without any beating about the bush. Well then, said he, first of all, I have to tell you that the common people consider your worship a mighty great madman, and me no less a fool. The Hidalgos say that, not keeping within the bounds of your quality of gentleman, you have assumed the dawn, and made a knight of yourself at a jump, with four vine minus stocks, and a couple of acres of land, and never a shirt to your back. The Cavalieros say they do not want to have Hidalgos setting up an opposition to them, particularly squire Hidalgos who polish their own shoes and darn their black stockings with green silk. That, said Don Quixote, does not apply to me, for I always go well dressed and never patched, ragged I may be but ragged more from the wear and tear of arms than of time. As to your worship's valor, courtesy, accomplishments, and task, there is a variety of opinions. Some say, mad but droll, others, valiant but unlucky, others, courteous but meddling, and then they go into such a number of things that they don't leave a whole bone either in your worship or in myself. Recollect, Sancho, said Don Quixote, 
that wherever virtue exists in an eminent degree it is persecuted. Few or none of the famous men that have lived escaped being calumniated by malice. Julius Caesar, the boldest, wisest, and bravest of captains, was charged with being ambitious, and not particularly cleanly in his dress, or pure in his morals. Of Alexander, whose deeds won him the name of great, they say that he was somewhat of a drunkard. Of Hercules, him of the many labors, it is said that he was lewd and luxurious. Of Don Galler, the brother of Amatus of Gaul, it was whispered that he was over quarrelsome, and of his brother that he was lacrimose. So that, O Sancho, amongst all these calumnies against good men, mine may be let pass, since they are no more than now. Don Quixote Chapter 2 414 Hast said That's just where it is, body of my father. Is there more, then, asked Don Quixote. There's the tale to be skinned yet, said Sancho, all so far as cakes and fancy bread, but if your worship wants to know all about the calumnies they bring against you, I will fetch you one this instant who can tell you the whole of them without missing an atom, for last night the son of Bartholomew Carrasco, who has been studying at Salamanca, came home after having been made a bachelor, and when I went to welcome him, he told me that your worship's history is already abroad in books. With the title of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha, and he says they mention me in it by my own name of Sancho Panza, and the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso too, and diverse things that happened to us when we were alone, so that I crossed myself and my wonder how the historian who wrote them down could have known them. I promise thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote, the author of our history will be some sage enchanter, for to such nothing that they choose to write about is hidden. What said Sancho, a sage and an enchanter? Why, the bachelor Samson Carrasco, that is the name of him I spoke of, says the author of the history is called Side Hamid Berenjana. That is a Moorish name, said Don Quixote. Maybe so, replied Sancho, for I have heard say that the Moors are mostly great lovers of Berenjanas. Thou must have mistaken the surname of this side minus which means in Arabic Lord minus Sancho, observed Don Quixote. Very likely, replied Sancho, but if your worship wishes me to fetch the bachelor, I will go for him in a twinkling. Thou wilt do me a great pleasure, my friend, said Don Quixote, for what thou hast told me has amazed me, and I shall not eat a morsel that will agree with me until I have heard all about it. Then I am off for him, said Sancho, and leaving his master he went in quest of the bachelor, with whom he returned in a short time, and, all three together, they had a very droll colloquy. Don Quixote Chapter 2 415 Chapter 3 Oh, if the laughable conversation that passed between Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and the bachelor Samson Carrasco. Don Quixote remained very deep in thought, waiting for the bachelor Carrasco, from whom he was to hear how he himself had been put into a book as Sancho said, and he could not persuade himself that any such history could be in existence, for the blood of the enemies he had slain was not yet dry on the blade of his sword, and now they wanted to make out that his mighty achievements were going about in print. For all that, he fancied some sage, either a friend or an enemy, might, by the aid of magic, have given them to the press, if a friend, in order to magnify and exalt them above the most famous ever achieved by any knight minus errant, if an enemy, to bring them to naught and degrade them below the meanest ever recorded of any low squire, though as he said to himself, the achievements of squires never were recorded. If, however, it were the fact that such a history were in existence, it must necessarily, being the story of a knight minus errant, be grandiloquent, lofty. Imposing, grand and true. With this he comforted himself somewhat, though it made him uncomfortable to think that the author was a Moor, judging by the title of side, and that no truth was to be looked for from Moors, as they are all impostors, cheats, and schemers. He was afraid he might have dealt with his love affairs in some indecorous fashion, that might tend to the discredit and prejudice of the purity of his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, he would have had him set forth the fidelity and respect he had always observed towards her spurning queens, empresses, and damsels of all sorts, and keeping in check the impetuosity of his natural impulses. Absorbed and wrapped up in these and divers other cogitations, he was found by Sancho and Carrasco, whom Don Quixote received with great courtesy. The bachelor, though he was called Samson, was of no great bodily size, but he was a very great wag. He was of a sallow complexion, but very sharp minus witted, somewhere about four minus and minus twenty years of age, with a round face, a flat nose, and a large mouth, all indications of a mischievous disposition and a love of fun and jokes, and of this he gave a sample as soon as he saw Don Quixote.
by falling on his knees before him and saying, Let me kiss your mightiness's hand, Senor Don Quixote of Law. Mancha 4 by the habit of St. Peter that I wear, though I have no more than the first four orders, your worship is one of the most famous knights minus errant that have ever been, or will be, all the world over. A blessing on side Hamid Benengeli, who has written the history of your great deeds, and a double blessing on that connoisseur who took the trouble of having it translated out of the Arabic into our Castilian vulgar tongue for the universal entertainment of the people. Don Quixote made him rise and said, So, then, it is true that there is a history of me. Don Quixote Chapter 3 416 And that it was a moor and a sage who wrote it. So true is it, senor, said Samson, that my belief is there are more than twelve thousand volumes of the said history in print this very day. Only ask Portugal, Barcelona, and Valencia, where they have been printed, and moreover there is a report that it is being printed at Antwerp, and I am persuaded there will not be a country or language in which there will not be a translation of it. One of the things, here observed Don Quixote, that ought to give most pleasure to a virtuous and eminent man is to find himself in his lifetime in print and in type, familiar in people's mouths with a good name. I say with a good name, for if it be the opposite, then there is no death to be compared to it. If it goes by good name and fame, said the bachelor, your worship alone bears away the palm from all the knights minus errant, for the more in his own language, and the Christian in his, have taken care to set before us your gallantry your high courage in encountering dangers, your fortitude in adversity, your patience under misfortunes as well as wounds, the purity and continence of the platonic loves of your worship, and my lady Dona Dulcinea del Toboso Minus. I never heard my lady Dulcinea called Dona, observed Sancho here, nothing more than the lady Dulcinea del Toboso, so here already the history is wrong. That is not an objection of any importance, replied Carrasco. Certainly not, said Don Quixote, but tell me, Senor Bachelor, what deeds of mine are they that are made most of in this history? On that point, replied the Bachelor, opinions differ, as tastes do. Some swear by the adventure of the windmills that your worship took to be Briarius's and giants, others by that of the fulling mills, one cries up the description of the two armies that afterwards took the appearance of two droves of sheep, another that of the dead body on its way to be buried at Segovia. A third says the liberation of the galley slaves is the best of all, and a fourth that nothing comes up to the affair with the Benedictine giants, and the battle with the valiant Biscayan. Tell me, Senor Bachelor, said Sancho at this point, does the adventure with the Yangesans come in, when our good Rocinante went hankering after dainties? The sage has left nothing in the ink minus bottle, replied Samson, he tells all and sets down everything even to the capers that worthy Sancho cut in the blanket. Don Quixote Chapter 3 417 I cut no capers in the blanket, returned Sancho, in the air I did, and more of them than I liked. There is no human history in the world, I suppose, said Don Quixote, that has not its ups and downs, but more than others such as deal with chivalry, for they can never be entirely made up of prosperous adventures. For all that, replied the bachelor, there are those who have read the history who say they would have been glad if the author had left out some of the countless cudgelings that were inflicted on Senor Don Quixote in various encounters. That's where the truth of the history comes in, said Sancho. At the same time they might fairly have passed them over in silence, observed Don Quixote, for there is no need of recording events which do not change or affect the truth of a history if they tend to bring the hero of it into contempt. Aeneas was not in truth and earnest so pious as Virgil represents him, nor Ulysses so wise as Homer describes him. That is true, said Samson, but it is one thing to write as a poet, another to write as a historian. The poet may describe or sing things, not as they were, but as they ought to have been, but the historian has to write them down, not as they ought to have been, but as they were, without adding anything to the truth or taking anything from it. Well then, said Sancho, if this senor more goes in for telling the truth, no doubt among my master's drubbings mine are to be found, for they never took the measure of his worship's shoulders without doing the same for my whole body, but I have no right to wonder at that for, as my master himself says, the members must share the pain of the head. You are a sly dog, Sancho, said Don Quixote, I faith, you have no want of memory when you choose to remember. 
If I were to try to forget the thwacks they gave me, said Sancho, my wheels would not let me, for they are still fresh on my ribs. Hush, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and don't interrupt the bachelor, whom I entreat to go on and tell all that is said about me in this history. And about me, said Sancho, for they say, too, that I am one of the principal presnages in it. Personages, not presnages, friend Sancho, said Samson. Don Quixote. Chapter 3 418